everyone, and welcome to the launch event for the 2020 edition of the 10 New Insights in Climate Science series. My name is Wendy Broadgate, and I'm the Global Hub Director for Sweden um, at Future Earth, one of the partnering organizations behind this report, alongside Earth League and the World Climate Research Programme. I'll be your host for today, along with my colleague, Eric Peel, lead author of the report and science officer at Future Earth. We're really happy you've joined us today to hear presentations from the report's authors on this year's 10 Insights. The 10 New Insights in Climate Science series aims to synthesize the latest climate research for the international science policy community. We've delivered the report annually since 2017. We're now in the decisive decade during which we need to bend the emissions curves and reduce emissions by half in order to meet the Paris Agreement. This makes our report more relevant than ever. While we've launched um, all previous reports at the United Nations Climate Change Conferences, we obviously weren't able to do that in 2020. Still, we are absolutely delighted to be joined by Mrs. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, who's graciously offered to continue her support for, for this work by again, helping introduce this report to the world. Before I invite Mrs. Espinosa to deliver some welcoming remarks, I'd like to thank the many report authors who've joined us today um, for this call, both for, the, um, both for the presentations and to answer your questions on the report, and for all their work in bringing this report together. Um, as, a, as the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll try to answer as, ma as many as possible um, in the hour we have together. Also, if you're watching on the live stream, um, you can send us your questions by using the hashtag 10ClimateInsights. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to help us frame this, important, this important contribution to the conversation on climate. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me again. Yes, indeed, this uh, report is uh, very dear to me. I remember when I first came into this position and uh, I had the opportunity uh, to speak with uh, uh, the director, the then director of the uh, Potsdam Clim Klima Institute about the importance of making science more available to the understanding of just regular people. So I am extremely grateful uh, to all of you for your hard work in putting together this, uh, this report. And I'm very happy to see that it has become a yearly um, a contribution, which I know it is making a difference. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, dear colleagues, what a difference a year can make. When we met for the launch of the third edition of your insights report, COVID was barely on our collective radars. One year later, we are all consumed by, by what is now a pandemic that is sweeping the world. And while coronavirus is the most urgent threat facing humanity today, we cannot forget that climate change is the biggest peril confronting civilization over the long term. It remains a threat multiplier tied to almost every major environmental and de developmental challenge the world faces. All that said, I believe that at the intersection of these two crises, a window of hope and opportunity opens, one that provides a chance for us to shape the economy of the 21st century in ways that are greener, cleaner, healthier, and more resilient. However, nations have not yet shown the ambition needed to drive the deep and rapid change required to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And unfortunately, good intentions and political commitments remain far apart. Despite some recent momentum in the right direction, 
A challenging amount of work remains to be done in the run-up to COP26 no next November, and of course, during the conference itself. COP26 must be a success. Our work for this year includes completing the outstanding work to make the Paris Agreement fully operational, moving forward to implementing the Paris Agreement and significantly boosting climate ambition. The climate simply does not care if we're dealing with a pandemic or not. The work must be completed. And COP26 is about more than the climate change agenda. It's the world's chance to renew confidence and credibility in multilateralism, and at the same time, provide tangible evidence of the value of international collaboration at a time that the world needs it most. Collaboration can trigger progress in a variety of other arenas, including fulfillment of the SDGs and the 2030 agenda. I am convinced that we stand at a unique point in history. We have all the pieces of the climate jigsaw puzzle laid out in front of us. And we have the roadmap to putting those pieces together in a coherent and cohesive climate approach for the world to follow. It is now a matter of commitment and determination. And in that regard, I take great heart in the tireless work of Future Earth, the Earth League, and the World Climate Research Program, which along with their research partners have produced this fourth Insights edition. Each time we meet, I talk about how science underpins everything we do at UN Climate Change. It's the basis for efforts to address climate change throughout the world. But perhaps never have we been shown such tangible proof about the importance and impact of science than in 2020 and 2021. And while we are not here to talk about the coronavirus, we are here to talk about the contributions of science. The coronavirus simply underlines the primacy of science and the applicability of it throughout all aspects of our society. And it is fundamental to the climate change struggle. What particularly impressed me about your reports is that they go beyond the latest scientific understanding of the drivers and impacts of climate change, which are of course central in our process. But the fact that your reports include the social, public, health, and economic ramifications of unchecked carbon emissions makes them, in my view, doubly valuable. I can assure you that the report's observations will be of tremendous value for our COP26 deliberations in November. And already now, the point you are making, for example, about COVID recovery packages not being aligned and not being supportive of the 1.5 goal is extremely important. That's a big challenge that we as international community have this, this year. I want to thank you once again for your valuable efforts and for our continuing and positive relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Espinosa. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we're also very grateful that you uh, and your team took the initiative of starting this. Um, so we're just following up and, and trying to present this each year um, to you. Okay, so let me just uh, present all of the authors who we have here. Uh, we're all representing the editorial board of the report. Um, so first out will be Detlef Stammer, uh, University of Hamburg, and co-chair of the Joint Scientific Committee for the World Climate Research Program, uh, join, uh, followed by Johan Rockström, uh, director um, of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research uh, and co-chair for both the Future Earth Advisory Committee and the Earth League. And finally, last but not least, uh, Elena Fischer, uh, head of research at the Nordic Africa Institute. So without further ado, I'd like to give the channel to Professor Stammer to, to start off.
Thank you very much and a warm welcome also from my side. There's, there's three insights and I will start with the first insight, which is on uh, improved model strengths and support for ambitious emission cuts to meet Paris Agreement. Now, this new insight is really focused or built around the fact that um, uh, the relation between uh, carbon emission in the atmosphere um, and the temperature rise um, on those um, uh, was always uh, attached with a certain amount of uncertainty. Um, this new insight is really related to the fact that this uncertainty had been narrowed and uh, to the point that the Earth's temperature response to doubling the levels of carbon uh, dioxide um, in the atmosphere is now better understood. While previous IPCC assessments have used this uh, estimated range of uh, 1.5 to 4.5 uh, for a temperature increase by doubling CO2. Recent research now suggests a narrow range um, of 2.3 to 4.5 degrees, um, which in fact makes it more ambitious uh, to, to really meet the, the Paris Agreement targets uh, and calls for more ambitious uh, cuts in, in, in the emissions. Um, this means that moderate emission really, um, reduction scenarios are less likely to meet the Paris Agreement's target than previously anticipated. Improved regional climate scale models provide better information about heavy rainfall events and hot and cold extremes. And regional climate predictions can now also be made better up to the decade ahead with higher skill than previously thought possible. So that's really Im improving the information that we get out of climate models. The second insight is related to the high latitudes and um, the permafrost uh, frost region there. And it's uh, really states that emissions from thawing permafrost likely to be worse than expected. Um, the effect of per uh, thawing permafrost are included in climate models um, and they always uh, actually release a certain amount of uh, CO2 in the models. The new insight really shows that this increase might in fact double um, the emission of greenhouse gases from permafrost uh, will be larger than earlier uh, projected because of abrupt thaw processes which are not yet included in global climate models. Um, so these are new processes that um, really indicate that the uh, release of uh, CO2 from these regions will be larger. These abrupt uh, thaw effects could, as, uh, could be as much as double the emissions from permafrost draw under um, moderate and high emission scenarios. Um, and emissions from permafrost uh, thaw could be yet higher due to effects of plant root activity, which increases soil um, respiration. And then the insight number three um, is related to the deforestation um, that is degrading the uh, tropical carbon sink. Um, the carbon sink on land is, is actually significant. It's about 30% of the uh, um, um, human emissions of carbon are being sucked up by uh, the uh, bioproductivity on land. Um, the uptake of carbon on land uh, by the ecosystem, uh, the land sink has grown with CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it acts as a fertilizer and this effect is increasingly being counteracted by human driven land use change, uh, particularly in the tropics. So the key insights here are that land ecosystems currently draw up to 30% of human CO2 emissions due to the CO2 fertilization effect on plants, but the deforestation of the world's tropical forests are causing these um, to level off as a carbon sink but this is balanced by greater recent carbon uptake in the northern hemisphere. Um, global plant biomass uptake of carbon due to CO2 fertilization may be limited in the future by nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, the CO2 emissions from land use change continue to be high in the 21st century and remain, remain a large threat to the land sink. And with this, I stop. Um, uh, the summary of the first three insights. So I'd like to hand over then to uh, Professor Dr. Johan Rockström um, to continue the presentations of the key insights. Hey, thanks, thanks, Eric, and um, wonderful to see you all. And then thanks, Patricia. Let me just re-emphasize that it's really thanks to you that uh, the 10 new insights in climate science have become 
an institution because uh, you expressed and committed so early to the to the need and the gap we're filling. This is a complement to the IPCC. It's a complement to all the global assessment. It's a light-footed and just as you express it, a way of, of really scanning off the avalanche of insights from science, from social science and natural sciences over the last 12 months and feeding it into a way that can communicate to, to all your climate negotiators in the, in the COP process for our future. The fourth insight really couples directly to, to Detler's third insight on the indications of losing carbon sinks in tropical forest systems, because we have known all the time when it comes to climate impact research that water, fresh water, is victim number one. Either too much water, too little water, or water in the wrong time. Now we see in this year's insight really important progress on much, much better um, evidence on the attribution of, of human caused water scarcity. We know that we have a water crisis around the corner if we continue unabated global warming. We know that the feedback dynamics are fundamental, that climate change combined with ecosystem change can lead to changes in precipitation levels affecting the stability of carbon sinks such as the rainforests around the world. We also know that drought conditions can today interact in what we can call perfect storms. In the Horn of Africa, the droughts related to or amplified, just as you pointed out, Patricia, as, as an amplifier during the droughts in 2019 and 2020, combined with the desert locust invasions and COVID-19 with food riots in the midst of a pandemic, is a form of water-related, food-related perfect storm we do not want to see. So this is why we need a much larger attention on water scarcity in future climate modeling and prediction of impacts. But the fundamental insight this year is really that climate extremes impacting water scarcity is already causing migration of millions of people around the world. We see more and more evidence on climate related water migration. Next insight. This is uh, a first off in our insights assessments that climate change can profoundly affect our mental health. If you take the next slide here, this is an under-researched area. It is a rapidly emerging area. I think the best way to kind of set the stage on this is actually what happened this morning with the world's largest opinion poll facilitated by Akin Stein and her colleagues at UNDP showing that 60 to 70 percent of citizens around the world are so deeply concerned about human-caused climate change that they are backing up the scientific conclusion of a climate emergency. If you take the next slide, please. This translates to climate change having larger acute and chronic mental health impacts that cover ranges all the way from light to severe conditions. This is something we're seeing with a rising concern of anxiety, distress, but also trauma, shock, paralysis, and also suicidal risks among, for example, which we have not been able to scientific con make the attributions to, but we see, for example, the challenges for many small-scale farmers around the world and rising suicide levels around, uh, in, particularly in, in, in distressed and marginal communities around the world. So this is an area that we think has to be understood and, of course, has very strong connections to COVID-19. Because with rising stress levels of mental health, we're also weaker in terms of our human resilience to deal with the stress of the pandemic. And the last insight here, or the conclusion here, is, is uh, directly combined, connected to COVID, because we know that the lockdown and trapping in urban concrete environments has raised the pandemic stress on human health. And we see the same line in terms of, of, our of evidence on climate change, that blue and green spaces in urban planning can help in reducing these mental health. Finally, uh, the number six insight, if you take the next slide, which is the one that you refer to, uh, Patricia, on the lack of uh, alignment with the green recoveries uh, on COVID-19. And if you take the next slide here, just to give two reflections on this. I mean, the number one is we have seen 2020, which scientifically uh, 
from the IPCC assessments is clearly the year when we had to bend the global curve of emissions. Paradoxically, that is actually happening due to the pandemic. Now, is this something that we can celebrate? The answer is no. This is a 6-7% global reduction in emissions for the wrong cause. We cannot shut down the global economy to solve the global climate crisis. But it shows that we are in a transformative exponential journey. That is, as Wendy pointed out, cutting emissions by half every decade is a pace which is equivalent every year of the COVID climate pace, 6-7% per year. The second conclusion of this insight, which you also related to Patricia, is the fact that the green recovery investments of up to 12 trillion US dollars is not so far aligning with a true green recovery that can support the 1.5 guardrail of the Paris Agreement. So this is a big challenge we're still facing. On the other hand, a little bit of a sideline from the content in our report, I would like to uh, just conclude by saying that given the fact that we've been able to mobilize trillions in the green recovery from COVID, never more should we be allowed to have a fight on filling the global climate fund with billions. Because how can we not have billions available for climate abatement when we have trillions available for the recovery from the pandemic? So I think this is an alignment and an integration also of the willingness to invest in the transition towards a safe future. And with that, back to you, uh, Wendy. Yeah, I can just mention here um, that uh, for those who are listening in um, to, the, to the webinar, um, you can ask questions in the Q&A in the bottom, um, and then our pa panelists from the insights can, can answer those. Um, so after that, I I'd like to hand over to Eleanor, uh, who can present the last four insights. Thank you very much, Eric. So moving on to insight seven, COVID-19 and climate change demonstrate the need for a new social contract. I think the starting point for this insight is that the world needs innovative, imaginative and transformative approaches to build sustainable and resilient societies. We've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic that it's exposed the inadequacy of an existing governance capabilities to navigate systemic crises, including climate related disasters. It's all too apparent how this causes consequences, not only for human health as in the case of COVID, but it also exposes racial and social inequality and can exacerbate intergenerational injustice. This raises the need for global agreements that create a new social contract between state and citizens that can act as the basis for governance reform to drive just systemic transitions and in the process strengthen the prospect for a stable climate. And this would emerge from a new social compact. So moving on to insight eight, economic stimulus focuses primarily on growth would jeopardize the Paris Agreement the inspiration for this insight is that an increasing number of studies provide solid evidence that there are co-benefits of climate action that is economically optimal to pursue two degrees C or lower of warming. In this context, the cost of renewable energy, battery electric vehicles and other low carbon solutions has fallen dramatically. A COVID-19 recovery strategy the world's chance based on to renew confidence based on growth first and sustainability second, as raised by Patricia, is likely to fail the Paris Agreement. And this is our concern. Evidence suggests a primary focus on greening the economy through sustainable investments will stimulate economic activity and provide other social, environmental and health co-benefits. On a final point, this is a universal necessity but there are equity dimensions, and it is particularly applies to high income countries that have resources to invest in greener solutions. So moving on to insight number nine, electrification in cities is pivotal, pivotal for just sustainability transitions. 
Now it's well established that um, electrification is a key enabler of decarbonisation. We we're only recently waking up really to the fact that urban areas can act as catalysts for these processes. In this respect, urban electrification is a powerful pathway to an equitable energy transition. Now this has a dual aspect. On the one hand, enabling populations who lack electricity to gain access. And that's very powerful. Over a billion people who lack electricity will benefit from stronger electrification efforts. And on the other hand, facilitating electricity as an alternative to other fuels. There are also co-benefits in terms of health and quality of life in relation to a reduction in air pollution. And in this respect, it helps align the clim climate adaptation and mitigation areas with the sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030. Um, now, of course, a key aspect for successful transition requires appropriate urban design and to be the focus of attention. Um, and in this um, area, the insight argues for decentralized energy systems that somehow disrupt centralized provision as it exists at present. So last but not least, new insight 10, going to court to defend human rights can be essential climate action. This insight relates to the fact that climate litigation is emerging as a crucial tool to address human rights issues related to climate change. And underpinning climate litigation is a really interesting expansion in notions of who or what is eligible for rights in court. Examples of children, future generations, and aspects of nature such as a river. Also linked to this is who has the capacity to represent them if they cannot represent themselves. We are finding in this area that an innovative aspect of climate litigation relates to the cross fertilization of ideas and outcomes between courts in different jurisdictions and at different levels, national and international, for example. And in all of this, courts enter as lawmakers to address climate change, given the absence of adequate climate action in other contexts. Thank you. So thank you um, to all the three presenters um, for this overview. Um, we will soon go to the, the Q&A, uh, where you'll be able to, to get your questions answered from the 10 experts that we have here who are lead authors of the various uh, chapters in the report. Um, I can just say that uh, Patricia Spinoza um, unfortunately could not stay with us for the full length of this webinar and had to leave for, for, another, um, for another meeting, but um, we will carry on and go through the, the Q&A. Um, and with us here, uh, you can see an overview here of the, the panelists that we have. Um, we have uh, research scientist Mark Selinka, um, who will go through the insight on climate sensitivity, Professor Ted Schur uh, on the insight on um, permafrost, uh, Professor Trevor Keenan will go through uh, land use change, uh, Dr. Nidhi Nagapatla um, going through um, the insights on uh, water stress, uh, Dr. Katie Hayes on mental health impacts, uh, Bangabandhu Chair Professor Joya Shri Roy um, on the uh, immediate responses to coronavirus uh, pandemic and also Professor uh, Michelle Scobie who will be going through the more long-term uh, governance response to, to a pandemic and what we can learn from this. Uh, researcher Eva Alfeson uh, at the economics and uh, growth. Uh, uh, Professor Vanessa Castanbroto um, going through uh, urban electrification. And finally, uh, Professor Otto Spikers um, on the climate litigation insight. We have a couple of questions that have come in. So I'd like to start on a question that perhaps some of you can touch on, uh, given some of the impacts we've seen or the, the feedbacks we're seeing in terms of, of wildfires, permafrost responses, etc. What are our likelihoods of achieving a one and a half or well below t two degrees um, uh, goals? 
uh, so maybe someone in, in inside one to three, um, Mark, Ted, or, or Trevor, if you want to answer to that. I see Mark, perhaps. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, um, so from the perspective of insight one, which was dealing with the climate sensitivity, um, you know, the big insight was that we've now um, pretty substantially narrowed the range of likely climate sensitivity. So that's the response of global warming to a doubling of CO2. And um, that, that kind of cuts both ways. It has good news and bad news. And the good news side of it is that we, um, you know, it's been shown to be pretty unlikely that these very high climate sensitivities that are suggested by some of the latest global Earth system models, you know, in excess of four or five degrees Celsius of warming for a doubling, um, those have largely been ruled out. And so what that means is that, you know, what humans do does matter. And it's not just an extremely sensitive climate um, such that whatever we do, you know, the climate's going to go off and warm um, by an extreme amount. But on the other hand, uh, the kind of the bad news side of it is that we've also raised the um, lower bound of that likelihood. So whereas before um, the IPCC um, was allowing for values as low as one and a half, you know, between one and a half and two uh, degrees warming for a doubling, um, we've now shown with this um, as part of this new insight that um, those values are pretty unlikely. And so mother nature is uh, not really doing us any favors in, in regard to the low end. So um, that implies that we do actually need to um, make some very large cuts in emissions in order to achieve these Paris goals. Um, we can't really rely on the climate system being insensitive to CO2, um, which you could have in the past rested your hopes on. Um, maybe the climate is not that sensitive and we can get away with kind of um, moderate cuts in emissions. But in fact, um, those very low climate sensitivities aren't very likely. And uh, it implies that moderate cuts are gonna be needed for um, meeting the Paris targets. Now, what exactly the, cu the cuts would need to be, you know, in a quantitative sense, um, I think still remains to be established and maybe others can comment on that. So wait, does anyone else want to comment on that? Sure, this is Ted Scher from Northern Arizona University. And I was, uh, mm -hmm author on the permafrost um, insight and maybe because it relates to this question about Arctic emissions, I'll follow Mark's comments. And this insight um, had to do with the fact that global climate model projections from the Arctic of future carbon emissions, both carbon dioxide and methane, were probably underestimating um, because of the fact that certain processes, specifically abrupt permafrost thaw, were not included in, in these process models. So recent work um, as highlighted in the insight shows that future carbon emissions are likely to be higher than past model projections were allowing for. So this is a little bit like Mark's um, story of the low end where we're sort of increasing the amount of future carbon emissions out of the Arctic. Now on the flip side, the question asks whether um, targets set by the Paris Agreement are still achievable and I think that that's the bright side of our um, insight, which is, you know, we don't find that Arctic carbon emissions are going to happen in sort of a, a, a vicious spiral where what humans do doesn't matter anymore. In fact, it sort of heightens the idea that um, what humans do to slow greenhouse gas emissions will actually slow warming in the Arctic and keep these emissions lower than they would be. And so I think it's it's the same message that Mark had with climate sensitivity. We have good sides and bad sides. We do have these climate feedbacks with these additional carbon um, emissions coming out of the Arctic, but by controlling human emissions, we can actually slow this process. And these Arctic carbon emissions will never dwarf um, carbon coming from human activities, and that remains a focal point of ac action. Thanks. Thank you, Ted and Mark, and it's it's good to hear from you that we still have some kind of level of control over the emissions, and it's it's still in our hands to to change this. Um, then that connects well to one of the questions that has come in. Um, you know, facing these climate risks that we have, um, and we we have managed to um, to raise very large funds for for COVID um, uh, for COVID recovery. Um, so uh, how do we uh, put pressure on governments to 
to work on green recovery plans. Um, and I'm particularly kind of what you and what you and organizations can do. But I think that's also a general question. So I was thinking maybe that um, Professor Roy could answer this for us. If you can hear. Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, yeah, I got it. So uh, uh, what, uh, what we really it tried to um, uh, show that uh, many countries are already uh, allocating their stimulus packages and especially the large countries like US, Japan, Germany, almost 15% of the GDP has been allocated. And uh, what we found is that uh, that 3.7 trillion USD of stimulus package, which has been allocated to environmentally relevant sectors, uh, are suitable for uh, many green investments. And um, uh, interestingly, what we find is that the global stimulus fund, which uh, could be mobilized um, at a very rapid speed by different countries, are amounting to almost 12 trillion USD. Uh, so the global investment requirement uh, for the Paris compatible pathway has been estimated to be uh, 1.4 trillion US dollars per year in the year 2020 to 2024. So what it simply means is that only very small portion of um, say 10% of the total stimulus package can meet the Paris compatible pathway. So, uh, uh, but what we notice is that which is uh, of concern is that this uh, G20 governments are committing, um, say, 233 billion US dollars to fossil fuel based activities, which are brown activities, which are going to lock in the world on the brown growth path, which needs to be avoided for the climate compatible pathway. So what it simply means is that compared to 233 billion US dollars, which has been for fossil fuel based activities, uh, the green activities um, uh, have been getting only 146 billion US dollar. So it simply means that money is there, but uh, we are not taking the right uh, decision or making the right choices for making the physical infrastructure or the energy efficiency solutions uh, to uh, hinder, uh, uh, to, to facilitate the um, Paris compatible pathway. Um, so this is important that we do not make such uh, uh, wrong lock-ins from now in terms of infrastructure and uh, the choices uh, 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 that we are making right now. Thank you so much, Professor Roy. Um, we have another question that's come in um, that I think that Katie Hayes uh, perhaps can, can answer for us. Uh, it says that already in 2009, we had the first conference on mental health um, and similar aspects related to climate change. So wh why has it taken so long for this issue to get higher up in the, in the, the scientific agenda? Thank you. It's a great question. I think generally, uh, when we look at um, funding for uh, this type of research, mental health funding um, typically can lag behind other types of funding. I think there are also just general challenges in the field of studying, measuring, and monitoring the mental health effects of climate change. Um, so attributing you know, environmental hazards to climate change and then attributing the mental health outcomes to these hazards. Also, when we look at isolating the mental health outcomes related to climate change from other compounding life stressors, that there's a challenge there. And also um, that we know that studying and uh, reporting on mental health indicators, um, it can be, mental health can be understood differently amongst different populations. So there are a whole host of these challenges, uh, but in general, I think one of the big issues is uh, underfunding of this type of research. Um, we're seeing that it's a growing area of study. Uh, there's been an, a number of recent reports and academic peer-reviewed literature coming out in the last decade, I would say, more so in the last two, three, four, five years, um, that we're starting to see more of this uh, come to the fore. And uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier, when we look at the general distress and concern, when we talk about climate change, we're starting to see 
kind of this uprising and people experiencing things that have been called eco-anxiety or climate anxiety and climate grief. And so we're starting to see this come up and be more in the common kind of language. And so I do think that going forward, we're going to see this being a key area of research um, and that there are many research gaps that ought to be addressed, but this is kind of a defining moment to really to speak to the importance of this type of work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a, a related question to this, uh, which may be slightly kind of outside what would you normally study, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, when we look at the corona pandemic that we've had, we see a tendency for a COVID uh, fatigue and, and, and how people um, have difficulties eventually of, of coping with being in the situation. Um, so do you think that we could have something similar with climate change that we see a even if we get a strong response um, initially when people understand this, um, how serious it is that it could be a, a fatigue and then you re return to bad old habits? That's a great question, yes. And I also really look at the how we communicate about climate change and how that affects our behaviors and behavior change. And so, yes, in terms of relating it to kind of the COVID fatigue, um, oftentimes there are the, the the language called eco paralysis or climate paralysis. So this is when we have so much information about climate change, we know we have a short time period to really address the issue, but we almost feel paralyzed to act. And so I think that there's some real opportunities to how we communicate about climate change. I think it's important that yes, we need to ring the alarm bells and talk about the dire projections and what's what's happening in our, in our current environments. We also need to be really careful about pairing all of those messages of alarm with messages of actions about what people can do about them. So really trying to empower a sense of action, um, whether it's through mitigation or adaptation, uh, making sure that people are accessing their blue and green spaces, which we know is really supportive of their well-being. We've also seen that in, in the COVID pandemic times, that that's quite supportive. So in terms of how we communicate about climate change, I think also affects our behavior change. And so similarly to what we're experiencing with COVID, there is this importance of how we empower actions and not lead to heightened eco-anxiety or apathy, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like a directed question to, um, to Eva Alfredsson um, for uh, insight, uh, on Insight 8. Um, when, so the, the, the question that has been posed uh, is that we, we, we can see from the IPCC, and I don't really know which report this is referring to, but that um, there, there is a link between growth and, and, and emissions. So why are we still talking about you know, growth as, as, a, as an indicator and, and as a target, do you think? Hmm. Hello. Uh, well, we are to a large extent living in a growth economy and we, it's all dependent on economic growth. Uh, it's how we distribute income uh, which people depend on, they need to have jobs, etc. So I think that's quite uh, natural. What we need to understand is that we need to find new ways uh, forward. Uh, we have in our Insight 8, uh, we have also, like all the rest of us, of you, we have a positive side. And we can clearly see that there is a change in the cost landscape. There is huge benefits of a transition to a green economy. Uh, the costs are reducing also. And I, I, I can see clearly that uh, we have this false perceived trade-off between uh, sustainability and economic development. Uh, this is behind us. I think there's not many who who say that business as usual is, is better. We need to have a green transition for a positive uh, economic development. But, and here we come to, closer to the question maybe, uh, there is also a warning in this insight and that is that the decoupling rates, uh, the rates uh, that decouple GDP growth from environmental pressure is not strong enough automatically. We need sharp policies in order to increase the decoupling rates. Uh, but there are solutions and it is possible to, to turn this around. 
but uh, we we need these economic stimulus packages to that are being rolled up to really focus on investments that do reduce emissions uh, substantially and also provide uh, well-being and uh, a more resilient long-term econ economy. Mm. So, th thank you, Eva. So it is possible. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Um, th thanks for taking that question and, and um, expanding on it. Um, I have a question that I think perhaps uh, Ted or, or Trevor could help answer together. Um, we see several, uh, you know, in this report and in others, we can see several um, types of, of feedback mechanism or, or drivers for increased emissions that are re particularly related to, to, to land. Um, and the I mean, deforestation, wildfires, permafrost. So if we try to, to quantify these and say, which are the most acute, which are the, the biggest, um, just to make, give, help people make sense of, you know, is it wildfires we should be worrying for? Is it the permafrost or is it deforestation? Um, perhaps starting with, with Trevor, do you want to pick that up? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think one of the, key things to keep in mind with the land use emissions is the large degree of uncertainty. Um, so models typically agree that there is an increase in land use emissions over the past two decades, but various bookkeeping methods uh, don't agree. And some predict an increase, some predict actually a decrease, and some say it's flat. Um, those increases uh, are about an order of magnitude of a pedogram over the past two decades. Uh, which is a large amount. So if, if that is true, then that's quite worrying and it is increasing over time, of course. Um, what is contributing to those increases in land use emissions um, is primarily deforestation, um, uh, particularly in tropical regions. We know this is a, a concern, but knowing that is also um, quite helpful because this is something where targeted investment can really help, uh, where programs to reduce deforestation can have a large impact and therefore a large impact on the global carbon cycle. The good news is that ecosystems globally are taking up more carbon than they have in the past decades. So they're responding to, uh, responding to CO2 fertilization primarily to increase more uh, their uptake of carbon and therefore slowing down the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. But you're right, this is being offset um, somewhat by increasing land use change emissions. Um, according to some estimates. But I think really what is needed is targeting the, the uncertainties in the land use change estimates themselves and really getting a handle on what, what the underlying dynamics are so as we can best target policy towards those areas that are leading to higher land use emissions. And, and Ted, do you want to weigh in on this one as well? Sure, I'll just add a little bit to what Trevor um, said. So you asked kind of about the, the relative strength of these feedbacks, Arctic carbon, wildfires. Um, uh, Trevor was just talking about land use change in the tropics. The reason we hear about these is that they're all critically important. The IPCC work and the models try to sort out sort of which are the most important. I think um, some of the key messages coming out of this is the reason you keep hearing about them is none of these feedbacks have gone away. And so they all seem to be playing a critical role in the future levels of atmospheric CO2. So we have um, human emissions, but then as has been mentioned earlier, we have a certain fraction of that, about a quarter being taken up by the land surface and stored in biomass. The reason we're hearing about wildfire now is that that has the potential to release some of that stored carbon. So the big question there is whether this land carbon sink can be maintained into the future most of the processes we, we think about suggest that it can't keep up forever, that this will be a diminishing factor as we keep releasing more and more human greenhouse gases. Now, the same is true for the Arctic region. We see that getting warmer about, it's warming twice as fast as the globe as a whole. There are big stores of carbon stored frozen in the permafrost. And most of what we see with the mechanisms there are that um, more warming leads to increased loss in the future. And some of those are highlighted in the insights this year. So while there is um, this range and this uncertainty that Trevor talked about, most of these point in the, in the direction that we have to have an increasing focus on reducing human 
greenhouse gas emissions because we really want to slow these kind of feedbacks in the Earth system that tend to kind of release more CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's what I'll add on to that. And, and that is the important work of the IPCC kind of highlighted in some of the insights here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to round this up. We have about seven minutes left. So I'd like to round this up uh, with the uh, panelists presenting a kind of a key takeaway from their insight, uh, perhaps in a, in a minute or so. What do you think are the most important things that, that you've learned and, and you think we should take with us? Um, perhaps things that weren't mentioned, you know, in, in detail, weren't, weren't picked up very much uh, in the report. Um, I'd like to begin with those who haven't uh, had questions uh, yet, which are, and I'll begin with um, Dr. Nidhi Nagavatla. Um, sorry for putting you in, in this, on the spot here, but. Uh, thank you, Eric. And I would, uh, I would like to emphasize on the point of human displacement and migration. One of the reports we produced early this year from United Nations University, we pointed out to the fact that by 2050, one billion people will be on the move due to various direct and indirect drivers. And water crisis and climate crisis is the center of these drivers acting in tandem or in combination with other drivers like conflicts, political instability, financial meltdowns. Taking note of that, it would be a, it would be a positive insight to see that migration discourse and migration policies are discussed in tandem with climate change mitigation and adaptation planning. And, and, and migration is accepted officially as a mode of adaptation. Thank you, Nova. Thank you. And uh, Michelle Scobie, um, would you like to, to take the floor next? Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, definitely our insight uh, showed the importance of governance and uh, one of the things the future is, does really well is uh, uniting science with the general public. And uh, one of the key insights that came from our research was a growing trend in the involvement of youth, uh, of indigenous groups, uh, of labor groups uh, in climate governance. And that's something that needs to continue, especially because there's a, gr a growing sensitivity of the importance of um, justice and uh, intergenerational justice and uh, the, in the effect of uh, uh, climate on less, less uh, well-equipped communities. And now we see there's a growing trend uh, towards the involvement of these communities. The, some of our, of our group has spoken about things like cosmopolitan governance, but we definitely need what we consider a new social impact. And that's the, that's the challenge, a new social impact where all the actors are involved in managing and solving the climate issues. And that continues to be a challenge that we have to, to achieve. Thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, Vanessa Castanbrotto, um, we'd like to also explain a bit what you think are the takeaways from your, your insight uh, on electrification. Yes, thank you. Uh, so as one of the one person commented in the, in the questions, uh, this elect uh, the urban electrification story is a, is a very positive one, but it's one that can only be achieved uh, in parallel with the deployment of the new rules. And also I want to say that uh, in our urban uh, we discussed that urban electrification also challenges existing models of infrastructure provision, which is, is, is not about providing more electricity, it's about providing better electricity. And uh, you can see that both in cities which are very uh, industrialized and where uh, new kind of technologies are being mobilized for transport and buildings, but also you can see that in places where uh, electricity access is compromised or the levels are very low and where even under the grid within a city, you may have a lot of people without access to electricity. And clearly the literature on community energy is coming up with very interesting solutions in different parts of the world, but perhaps to highlight the, the progress done in Malawi and Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, and next, uh, Otto, perhaps you want to add something on your insight as well on uh, climate litigation? Uh, yes, yes, sure. 
So actually, the main insights from uh, from number ten it nicely follows uh, what uh, Michelle Scobie has just said about her insight number seven. Um, so uh, climate litigation gives individuals, um, uh, yeah, a sense of ownership, but also a considerable degree of influence in policy making relating to the uh, our efforts to combat climate change. So um, people are no longer the, the powerless, uh, uh, the, the powerless that they used to be. That they can actually have a considerable and very meaningful influence uh, through the courts. And the courts can also act as a catalyst uh, if uh, policymakers are not acting up on their responsibility. So then lawmakers can remind them of that, on, uh, of that responsibility. Um, and also uh, climate litigation sort of uh, emphasizes or, or reminds people of the urgency of the combat of climate change yeah, by seeing it as a threat to, to the life and, uh, and the enjoyment of a healthy uh, environment of people. Mm, thank you so much, Otto. Um, we are approaching the, the end of this webinar. Um, so I'd like to hand back to Wendy um, to, to close for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Eric. And thank you all for tuning in and for your really rich array of questions. Um, before we close, I'd like to extend my thanks again to all of our panelists and presenters, as well as the scientists and organizations that have contributed to this report. And finally, um, to all our colleagues at the UNFCCC for helping us share these insights with the world. As Ms. Espinoza said at the start, COP26 must be a success and it must be underpinned by science. We have no time to waste. Thank you all and see many of you again for our next report launch at the COP26. Thank you, goodbye.